Starting from the summer of 2023, Conan will conquer comics once again, this time by way of Titan Comics. What is interesting about that is that in the past, the Conan comics were always made under license, first to Marvel from the 70s up till the 90s, then Dark Horse from the early 2000s, and in the last few years, Marvel again. But now, the comics will be made by Titan, under the direct supervision of Heroic Signatures, the owner of the Conan rights, who by way of Funcom also oversees Conan Exiles. So, what can we expect of Titan's Conan? Will there be any synergies? To find out, we are about to talk with head writer Jim Zub. But before that, to talk about how Conan came to Titan to begin with, and why Jim Zub was chosen to spearhead the new series in the first place. It is my honor and privilege to welcome back to Midnight's Edge the keeper of the Conan legend and the head of heroic signatures, Fredrik Malmberg. Thank you, Andrea. It's too uh, early for me to have uh, scotch, but uh, enjoy yours before you go to bed. <laughs> well, thank you. I will. Uh, I will do my best. Always enjoy some some scotch and some cognac and what what have you, especially when in such esteemed company talking some Conan. So. Tell us, uh, the transition from Marvel to Titan, what can you share? Uh, well, I think it's uh, fairly, it's common knowledge now that Marvel didn't renew the license they had when it was um, up for uh, renewal. And we had a pretty easy discussion internally when we then decided it was time for us to self-publish Conan. It's, always, it's been a perennial comic book staple for 50 years. Uh, Savage Sword, I think, is 49 years now. It's coming up on the 50th anniversary. So we never had really the financial muscle or the distribution capabilities. But when we started realizing that, you know, with Panini, our rest of the world or foreign language partner, we've been working with them personally. I've been working with them for more than 20 years. And Colum Properties has worked with Panini for 40 years. And they handle all the rest of the world. So what we needed was to solve the uh, English language, that is the UK and North America, um, distribution, marketing, publishing, printing, all of that, solicitations. Um, but we started basically lining up creative uh, talent. I knew Jim, of course, Jim was, um, and, and all the, I, I really knew all the Marvel writers and artists, not, not as well as I knew Jim. He's also a gamer. He's been in the gaming industry. We've met at both Comic-Con and Gen Con. And, and so that was an easy discussion to have. Uh, he came back pretty quickly and said, let me think about a take because you have with Conan the Barbarian, it's our staple. That's the workhorse. It's the monthly comic book that needs to, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's basically not where, um, the heroes come and die. It's the one that's the attrition warfare. So you need to have somebody who's really understands that can set long arcs for the character. And also, I think it was important that for us that we get somebody who really understands the character. Um, and then during this creative launch, when we started thinking about what's it going to be like, um, we the, it sort of started leaking out that we were not going to be with Marvel uh, for much longer. And um, we were approached by a number of publishers who then wanted to collaborate uh, and co-publish or take out a license. But at that point, we were already, nope, we're not going to do another license. We'll do this ourselves. We want to be true to the Robert E. Howard, to the, to the, you know, we don't want to be bound by any comics code or anything like that. Uh, so we very quickly ended up actually with Titan Comics. I know the, um, owner and founder, uh, Nick Landau and his wife, Vivian, very well. Uh, when I had, when I ran the tradition game stores and well, it was more than game stores, but the tradition stores in Sweden, um, Nick Landau and Titan distributors were the go-to distributor for all of mainland Europe for sci-fi books and stuff. So we've known each other a long time and we had entered the year before into an agreement where we would be publishing new Conan novels, books, short stories, ebooks through Titan for the English language. And, uh, and so it was actually a very quick discussion with them where, um, we, we needed to sort out the financial details, but 
they really wanted to come in heavily on on our publishing plans and um, so we made an agreement with them very quickly actually uh and uh jim zub when he started thinking about the creative take and the pitch he is the one who brought up that we should have rob for the monthly and we had seen rob's work and loved it on a few covers he, he was only solicited to do some covers for marvel I, I was not familiar with him and his work before that, but we love that work. And Jim said, I think this guy could actually uh, be our monthly uh, artist. And that is not an easy task because you, you work under a deadline and you have to, to um, you know, draw a lot. And, uh, but we trusted Jim and uh, reached out to Rob, who is, I mean, basically is, he's like a, I, I can't even, describe him everybody who's seen his artwork they it's throwbacks to bushima big john it's throwback it's also very modern in the same sense he gets the character he yeah it's well what do you think Andre? what have, have you you've seen his stuff it's a Buchema reborn and uh, yeah it looks amazing that's one of the things i'm being most excited about like the moment i heard that oh rob de la torre is doing the art I'm sold because in the entire Marvel run, the recent one, there was a lot of good in it. Some things a little bit mixed, but one thing that really stood out was the artwork. And best of the lot there was Rob de la Torre. The, the one story that he drew, that was Buchema come to life. And uh, with uh, with uh, Jim Sub unleashed with the... Uh, Rob or not, I think we're into something special here. I agree. I, I really think so. There are some more people that we uh, will bring out, and we have a very, very cool project which will hopefully be announced this. Well, it will be announced this summer uh, on the comics front, which will be very exciting for many people. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, so there will be more, more, more Conan published than in a long time, and. Hopefully, um, people will will buy it and solicit it from their uh, comic book stores and support it. But we're we're really uh, listening to the fans, and uh, I hope this will be um, a long and and great creative run. I really do. I am sure it will. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time, Frederick. And now it is time to talk to the man who will be spearheading the new exploits of Conan, a talented writer whom we have had on twice before. So for the third time, it is my pleasure to welcome to Midnight's Edge, Jim Zub. Thank you. Uh, I guess in Canada we would call this a hat trick. That's what they call it when you score three goals in uh, in hockey. So we'll we'll take that here as well. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, Jim, tell me, how was it from your point of view to uh, to get involved with uh, Conan yet again? Once again, <laughs> Marvel run. Yeah, it's it's uh, surreal, honestly, and amazing at the same time. I had multiple points in my career. I have assumed like, oh, this is my only chance to write Conan the Barbarian. This is my last chance to write Conan the Barbarian. It'll never happen again. And I'm always, every single time. I get a chance, I, and it's a bit of a joke, but like to be a bard for the barbarian, uh, I got to put my all into it. And and that was the case when I was writing the monthly book at Marvel. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Mark Basso, my editor, was great. All the artists that we worked with were amazing. Uh, Antonio, you know, Roge and and um, Corey Smith and everyone. They worked really, really hard on the book. But we just slammed into, you know, a weird market that happened in and around the pandemic stuff and and. Marvel and, uh, you know, the license came to an end and it was like, okay, we ended on the big issue 300, uh, which was an awesome experience. And I thought that's it. That's where it would sort of go. But Fred and I had stayed in touch and that was really key there. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of all the Robert E. Howard stuff and the High Boring Age. And we just kept talking in general. I was really curious what they were going to do next, where they were going to go with it. Um, not actually expecting that I would necessarily stay on board. Though, you know, maybe whatever, on some anniversary or some sort of collections or coming in and do short stories and whatnot. But the more we talked about it, the more we realized there was a lot that I had hoped that I could do at Marvel or that I wanted to do kind of long term or just bigger, broader kind of visions for what, you know, these properties should be and how they can be, you know, utilized. 
my love of the characters and my love of the world and the lore. And so Fred and I just kept in touch. And he, as they were kind of aligning their new plans, both with Titan in terms of publishing, but also just the stuff that, you know, Funcom has been doing on the video game end or, you know, discussions that are happening on broader kind of media uh, things that really those are, you know, for Fred and the team to, to kind of move forward with how they were seeing the bigger picture. And uh, I was still really passionate about it. We were still really engaged. And so we just sort of brain stuff, brainstorm stuff back and forth, like what the possibilities were and how, what a bigger kind of longer vision of uh, Conan the Barbarian could be in terms of comic publishing. So as the Titan plan kind of came together, I was in discussion and kind of on the table as a possible um, writer and just sort of laid out, this is what I think could work. This is how you could build it in long-term. And that's what I've always wanted to do. And uh, I was genuinely you know, surprised and thrilled that Fred was still super on board with what I wanted to do. And one of the things we needed to figure out was what, who would draw it and how would we sort of build it out? And then Matt Murray came on board and he's the editor that's working now for Heroic Signatures. So it's a pretty unique situation. Um, because it's not just a matter of Titan is publishing the book. Titan is publishing the English version of the book that's coming out in partnership with Heroic Signatures. So uh, I don't know the exact behind the scenes things, but essentially what was Conan Properties is now Heroic Signatures and the whole Robert E. Howard kind of canon is there and they're in partnership with Titan to build this line out. And Conan is the flagship book. Uh, I discussed what artist I wanted to have on the book we got exactly kind of the creative team that I've wanted and we are charging forward with the biggest, one of the biggest projects of my career, uh, relaunching Conan at Titan. All guns are blazing and we are uh, crushing it. We're having the time of our lives on it. That's fantastic to hear. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your approach to the sure. Titan comics, because when we look back at the past of the Conan comics, like for instance, the most recent Marvel run, mm -hmm. uh, your run was obviously serialized, but, right. uh, but when we look at the run as a whole between Conan the Barbarian, the main title, and the revived Savage sort of Conan uh, as a whole, everything was uh, anthology style, kind of like the original run of Savage Sword of Conan. Whereas with Dark Horse, the whole thing was serialized other than the occasional miniseries. And of course, the original Marvel run, there you had Conan the Barbarian, the main title, which was serialized, everything in order, plus the Savage Sword, which was mostly anthology. Right. Where does this continue with the Titan series? Right. So we kind of looked at a bunch of different options for it. And what I, the difficulty there is obviously you have this character with such amazing rich history and all these different kind of versions of Conan, the sort of three major eras of him, you know, him and his youth running around, getting into trouble, exploring, uh, you know, the world for the first time, leaving Sumeria and seeing more uh, of the world around him. You've got him in his prime, you know, starting to become a leader of men and, and understanding his sort of place and in, in between kind of savagery and civilization. And then you have Conan the King and all three of those eras are fertile ground to dig into. And so we wanted to allow ourselves the chance to tell different kinds of stories, but they need to have kind of connective tissue. They have to have kind of a reason for people to come back every month. So we're not doing serialized in the sense that we're going to have Conan at the start of his career and then just every single moment from his early days into every single moment of his prime into the king. We are going to move around quite a bit, but there's going to be these bigger, broader kind of stories that we're going to tell. Conan's life is a series of these kind of cool echoing patterns where things that happened to him in his younger days have an effect on him in his prime and potentially have an effect on him later, you know, as the king. And so we wanted to be able to explore that kind of stuff. So the very first story is, uh, I don't even think we've named the story arc yet, so I'm going to keep that kind of close to my chest. But the stuff that happens in the first story arc is self-contained. It's an adventure that you can read and enjoy from start to finish. But then the second story, even though we jump ahead a little bit in the timeline, there's connective tissue there plot-wise. And the same thing will happen with our third story arc, that if you read the entire first year 
of Conan the Barbarian, the new series of Titan, you're going to get this really cool epic adventure. And it's all going to kind of round out and be really, really enjoyable from start to finish. And yet you can also read kind of each one, each arc on its own, and not feel completely lost. That there is sort of a nice demarcation point of, okay, a new adventure begins. If you've been reading along, you'll enjoy it. You'll know these bigger kind of picture things that we're doing, but you're not going to be left out in the in the cold if you haven't been reading the entire series and the same thing's going to happen with year two of the series we've already started planning out those big beats as well that we're trying to kind of find the middle point between those two types of things we know that the market has changed you can't just do serialized storytelling month to month to month and hope that people are always going to hang on but by the same token I think that you can create as much jumping off points as jumping on points if you're not careful. And so I want to do a big long run that works on its own, that extends out and, and is a satisfying read from start to finish, but it's easy to jump in like the comics, honestly, that I grew up with. You know, most people, when I was a kid, it's not like you got issue ones, everything was in the middle of a run. You dove in and you understood the characters immediately because they were great reads and because they were easy to, uh, you know, easy to understand their motivations and and where we were going with them. Yeah, that was always one of uh, Conan's strengths. It's so easy to jump into at literally any point. Uh, this is uh, something that was carried on from Robert E. Howard. Yeah, um, these, ever... these stories should be easy to pick up and accessible. Like that, I, when people tell me that oh, they're intimidated to start reading Conan the Barbarian, I'm like, it's easier than any superhero title. Honestly, the continuity, as you think of it, is so much, uh, not looser, like there are threads that carry through, but you just need to know this character is a survivor. The Hyborian Age is this kind of, you know, over the top pre-civilization uh, of the world with big, amazing adventure. And wherever Conan goes, there will be danger and there will be adventure and opportunity. Exactly. Uh, but going back to Robert E. Howard, because he <laughs> wrote these original stories, and I assume that like in previous run, the original stories by Howard will be treated kind of as canon? The, yeah, the 21 original stories are the canon. They're the baseline foundation of what we're doing, obviously. And so you'll be able to chart where these stories take place between those other ones. We're not doing straight out adaptation of those stories at the start. I'm not saying that we'll never do it because, uh, you know, I would love to. I would love to see Rob's vision or some of the art other artists that we're talking to about, you know, coming on board potentially later on. I would love to see their vision for whatever, Tower of the Elephant or Red Nails or something really cool like that. But I don't want to come out of the gate like a cover band. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't just about playing the greatest hits. This is about us saying, look, you can make awesome modern you know pastiche stories that feel like the best of pulp that feel like robert e howard or roy thomas at their you know finest and and uphold the legacy of the characters and that's really important to us on the note of robert e howard and the original stories and their order because this of course mm. has always been uh, a debate among fans sure. the original marvel comics run uh, they followed the Millard and uh, John D. Clark timeline of which order the original stories were placed. And this, of course, also included then the pastiche stories that came mm -hmm. out later. So that was what Roy, Roy Thomas uh, based uh, his writing upon. But then later for the Dark Horse reboot, they went back to uh, back to the drawing board, as it were, and created a new Dark Horse chronology. More specifically, this would be the Ripke chronology. Right. Which chronology are you following for these stories for Titan? A brand new one, or will you be reusing an older chronology? Um, it is a new one, so I it's not. I think that's up to Heroic Signatures whether or not they're going to formally release that. Uh, publicly what our timeline is, but I've gotten an actual document from Fred and the Heroic Signatures crew that says this is the timeline that we're following, this is the order of stories, and it includes, you know, here's Conan's age for each of these stories. Um, what we did, Matt and I as well, is based on that timeline that I was given, we took the Hyborian age map and essentially, you know, placed these pins on the map and sort of said, okay, he's this old at this point. Now he can be traveling all over the place, but geographically, 
he should be somewhere you know, remotely in this area at this era, or he travels at some point. Obviously, he moves from here to here. What does that mean? Well, that gives us all sorts of cool potential. We can have him go on meandering paths. He, it's not like he's going in a straight line. There's tons and tons of opportunity there for us to tell cool stories. But we've got these overall kind of uh, a diagram of of the movements and, and kind of the travel of Conan the Barbarian on that original timeline. And so that just gives us, yeah, kind of a broader path. Um, as far as I know, the timeline that has been built is slightly different than previous ones. Um, I haven't sat down and done exact comparisons between the other two that you had and this new one. As soon as I was given this document, you know, my goal is, okay, we're following this. This is the one that we're building off of. This is what, Funcom is using, this is what Heroic Signatures is using, this is what I'm using going forward. And I don't think there's anything really radical as far as that stuff goes. There's not some massive shift or change within the scope of that. Um, but there are slight little adjustments or we're making, taking some of the vagaries and sort of saying, okay, let's put a year, let's put an age on this, where in earlier timelines, they might have said, well, he's between these kinds of ages. We'll say he is this, and that gives us something a little bit cleaner to build off of. All right. And speaking of building off of, yeah. uh, there have obviously been many comic runs before in Conan, mm -hmm. some very, very good ones. Uh, others, a little bit more mixed. Uh, right. But which ones, uh, which ones uh, did you draw inspiration from in particular? Is right. there any era of the comics where you saw there? That's what we're doing. I think, obviously, you know, beyond the prose stories, uh, the actual comic era stuff, the original Savage Sword stories are so indelibly, you know, kind of, of placed in my mind. They're like branded there. Some of that imagery. I love the black and white stuff. I love the kind of intensity of those stories, particularly as a kid. It really knocked me out that they could go that far with it. So, you know, the Roy Thomas, John Buscema stuff is absolutely seminal. And I think you'll see that we're wearing our heart on our sleeve pretty intensely with that stuff. I absolutely love, of the more modern stuff, obviously, you know, the Busick Nord run is killer. And that brought me back into Conan after years away. Absolutely loved it. And I think it brought a lot of people back in the door. In, the, in a lot of ways, the Conan number zero issue that we have coming out in May is, is as much a mission statement as Conan number zero was for Dark Horse back in 2003, that it was a way to sort of plant a flag in the ground and say, this is our vision for the character. This is what we think is most important. These are the, this is the visual kind of language we're going to be using. This is the narrative style that we're going to be going with. And I feel like, you know, Busick and Nord absolutely crushed it and set a really high bar in terms of that expectation. And so in my mind, that's what we've got to do. We've got this zero issue coming out on free comic book day. And that is our chance to kind of come out all guns a blazing and just go, look at this thing. It's killer. This is, if you haven't been reading Conan for years, you got to get back on board. If you are a longtime fan, we're going to give you something awesome that is going to hit all the best, you know, kind of buttons that, that you want. And if you've never read Conan the Barbarian before, this thing's going to turn your head and it's going to grab your attention. Yeah, on that note, um, because you've obviously written Conan before. You yeah. really wrote Conan for Marvel. That's how you first uh, got to know Fred Malmberg and uh, the mm -hmm. guys over at Heroic Signatures. Before that, even, you actually wrote some Conan over at Dark Horse, and you yes. were even instrumental in coming up with the color palette for the original Dark Horse <laughs> paperbacks run. And I'm especially grateful for that, because that's oh, actually thanks. what really brought me into Conan. That oh, was that's like so those cool. reprints. So yeah. I wouldn't be the Conan fan I was without that. Yeah, Chron probably. Chronicles of Conan was my first published comic gig. It was a coloring gig that I did as part of the Udon studio back in the summer of 2003. And it was so funny because I went to San Diego Comic-Con that year as um, Conan number zero came out. And so, you know, being a part of that Dark Horse kind of launch in a very, very, very tiny way. I was coloring reprints, but like seeing the excitement that people had for the character after all these years and and being part of that reprint kind of program, I colored like, I think four different issues that the studio was doing at that time. I was like, man, I get to, you know, 
be a part of this cool thing in a tiny way. I never imagined that years later I would get a chance to write the character when I teamed up with Gail Simone and we did the Conan Red Sonja book in 2015. That was like, oh my God, I got to write a Conan story. This is the coolest thing ever. And now to have all these issues under my belt, whether it's, you know, Conan Serpent War or uh, Savage Sword of Conan, I've done, you know, that gambler story or obviously writing the, the monthly book. I did 13 issues at Marvel before the license wrapped up. And so every time it's just like an absolute honor. And this one now coming out of the gate at Titan is just like the biggest kind of boldest version that we can do. It's it's everything that I've wanted it to be. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you about. Uh, is there any like difference in terms of like either restrictions with what right. you can do or creative direction now under heroic signatures compared to your previous experiences under both Dark Horse and Marvel? Sure. I mean, it's different in the sense there's one less layer of approvals because I'm working directly for the people that are approving it. I'm, I am I write directly for Heroic Signatures. And that's nothing against Marvel or Dark Horse. That's just the nature of a license where you have to work with a publisher and then work with the licensor. I write for the licensor. So, you know, Matt Murray, who is this amazing editor, we work together. We almost talk weekly on calls. So we jump on a Zoom call and we're constantly planning and chatting and kibitzing and laughing. And, and that is such a great feeling to have that direct kind of access to the people who are, you know, plotting out the future of the character and the franchise. And so we're constantly brainstorming to a cool stuff or we're talking about great ideas or sending each other links of, hey, check this artist out. They would be awesome for a cover or potential future stuff or isn't this amazing or oh did you you know the 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 chatter is constant and that excitement is is really rich in terms of content um we're not i i don't think the marvel book was necessarily restrictive in the sense marvel's got their broader kind of of um you know expectation in terms of violence that you can put on the page titans even looser in that way it's much more like the classic savage sword we've got um you know violence in the book that i never would have been able to get away with at marvel right in the the first issue uh it, it is wild stuff rob de la torre is drawing the character from the savage sword he's drawing the big wild unleashed kind of conan that that i remembered growing up the violence is intense we're lopping off limbs. Uh, the women are absolutely stunning. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty classic kind of pulp fantasy in that way. There is uh, big love and big violence and big everything. It is uh, intense. And again, as I said before, I think issue zero is going to be a statement piece. People are going to see what's in there and they're going to know exactly what we're going for. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the artwork because sure. um, Rob he uh, he did uh, one he didn't do one full issue but he did like right. one mini story inside of one of the larger issues and I have to say that issue was the most mind blowing uh, yeah. of uh, yeah. all of them especially when it came to the art can you tell us about how you went forth to to get him who sure. whose art I can best describe as. Uh, John Buscema reborn. Yeah, it feels like a right? regular artist. I know he's John Buscema by way of Frank Rosetta. It's got this beautiful line. He's got incredible energy. He's clearly inspired by the old school stuff, but he brings uh, I, what I can't wait for you to see is these pages. His storytelling is so good and it's so rich. Uh, I could not be be happier. So Rob Lotore is this phenomenal artist. He's actually been in comics for quite a while but he's never had the kind of marquee sort of title or, or opportunity like this. Uh, several years ago, he started doing commission pieces of Conan the Barbarian. And I don't know how else to describe it. You'd have to ask him, but like something unlocked, like it, it was the perfect fit for the kind of art he wanted to do for the kind of characters he wanted to draw for the sort of, of just amazing savage unleashed kind of hyborian age that all of us see in our minds the same kind of feeling that i got looking at those lancer paperback covers of frank frazetta when i first saw them as a kid or the classic kind of savage sword stuff or or you know conan the barbarian of of my youth let's put it that way the first time i saw his stuff was actually he did a variant cover 
on um, Conan the Barbarian number 17. So that was like my fifth issue. You know, we always had variant cover artists doing an alt cover. There would be the main cover being done by Eric Gist, who does these amazing uh, oil paintings. And then there was the alt cover and they were different artists sort of rotating through. And I saw this alt cover for number 17 and it was Conan like riding on a horse, cutting his way through this army. And I could not believe it. I was like, who is this guy? And I actually asked my um, my editor, Mark Basso. I was like, who's this guy? So I was this guy, Robert de la Torre. Uh, he's this you know artist in Spain. Uh, I said, this guy's awesome. Does he do sequentials? And he said, I think so. We're talking to him about doing some other stuff, but I don't know how fast he is and all these kinds of things. I said, man, I would love to work with this guy. So I sought him out. I found his page on Instagram and I could see he had been doing these commissions for a good year and a half at that point of various characters of the Hyborian age. He was drawing these just stunning commission pieces of, of, and not just characters standing around like Conan in the middle of a fight with 20 guys, or just like cutting down armies of monsters or, you know, uh, uh, in the, in the crushing grip of a giant snake or saving, you know, women and, that like everything that that I think of as that classic kind of pulp artwork, but modern. You're looking at the signature and it says 2020, 2021 on these on these commission pieces. And I'm like, it feels so old school, so like strong, so masterfully done. And so we just started up a dialogue back and forth over uh, Facebook Messenger. I added him on Facebook. We just started chatting. I bought a commission from him. He did a really cool piece of Conan just sort of charging forth. And I thought, oh, this will be a nice piece of original art to have. And then we started talking about potential project stuff. He had read some of the Marvel issues I'd done and he liked the stories. He liked when we were talking back and forth about the character and how this stuff sort of worked. And I said, well, you know, if you don't get to do more Conan the Barbarian, we should just do like a badass fantasy story, like just you and I. And we were sort of bandying back and forth and then talking about the possibilities. And at the same time, you know, I'm talking to Fred about the potential future of the franchise. And so Fred said to me, you know, if we want to come out of the gate, like as big as possible with a new title at a new publisher, who would you get to draw it? And I said, this guy, and I, you know, he had seen his artwork, Fred had seen his artwork. And I was like, is, you know, he said, is he available? I said, I don't know, but I'm talking to him. And so we just kept up that conversation. I introduced him to Matt Murray as Matt was brought on board as the editor. And then it was just a matter of trying to put all the ducks in a row schedule wise. Um, Matt hired Rob to do the black and white illustrations that went into the new Conan prose novel that they put out. Um, and they were stunning. And so we just like, once Titan got brought on board, we all kind of just pointed and said, this is the guy we've got to, you know, get him on board. And then Rob and I started talking and he said, you know, he'd done other story stuff and he found the full script format kind of restrictive that, that someone else is telling him panel one, do this panel two, do this panel three, do that. And he said, you know, I have a more holistic kind of approach. I want to kind of do it old school. And I said, I would be willing to do that. And so we're actually collaborating in a really interesting way where I'm doing it like Roy Thomas or Stan would have back in the day, I'm writing it plot style. So I say on this page, these are the story beats or over the course of these three pages, this is the combat. And here's the important things we need plot wise to happen. But you figure out how many panels that requires, you figure out how we wanna tell this visually you design these spaces if that's where you feel most comfortable and excited. And I just want you to be happy. I want you to be unleashed on the page and, and be putting your best foot forward, you know, unleashing the kind of visuals that I know you can do. And if you need more guidance or you want reference material, I'm happy to gather it for you, but I'm not here to get in your way. You are a brilliant artist and storyteller. And if this is the way you want to tell a story, I can match it you know? And so the free comic book day issue was also kind of a testing ground for us to make sure that we could make this kind of uh, working relationship, you know, function. He's sending me these pages after I did the outline, they're stunning. And then I'm scripting them afterwards. I'm adding the dialogue. I'm adding the kind of soaring captions and narrative that, um, that the artwork deserves. And in some ways it's a different kind of a challenge because instead of me having to imagine the panel and then come up with the text and then do some slight adjustments once the art comes in. I kind of have all the black and white stuff in front of me and I'm just trying to live up to 
the incredible visuals that Rob is capable of. When he sends in, you know, the Battle of Venarium, which is the first kind of battle that Conan fights in when he's young and, uh, you know, the first time he's ever gone to war and and sees the true kind of price of, of violence and what is what it is to be, you know, kind of a Sumerian and all that sort of stuff. He, um, I've seen that portrayed in different images, but Rob's version is bonkers. It's so incredible. There's so much, these armies crashing into each other with Conan right in the middle of it, uh, uh, bodies flying everywhere and the violence and destruction. It's like something right out of my imagination, you know? And when you see that and then you go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to live up to this narrative. I've got to put the text down that's going to level this up as much as possible. Hopefully the way this works is we just keep leveling each other up. We just keep inspiring each other. You know, when I sent in the script for uh, the, the plot outline for issue two and Rob messages me back and he goes, I read it and I see this thing deep in my mind and I can't wait to show you. I'm like, oh man, that's all I've ever wanted. Like to, to be working with an artist this closely and for us both to be so in sync in terms of the vision that we're trying to unleash on the page. Man, it is, it is really something special, honestly. That is fantastic. Uh, and one final thing, and that is mm -hmm. when people go to their retailer and they see the first issue on shelves, or better yeah. yet, they order it online, because now mm -hmm. you have free comic book day coming, uh, coming yeah. up here soon, before the first issue will be out in July. The link for ordering will be in the description, so everyone to check that out. But if you were to give everyone who who hasn't read to be, be Conan before, give us a one minute pitch. Why should right. anyone pick up Conan in this day and age? Right. So, you know, here's the broad thing about Conan the Barbarian. And these stories, fantasy stories, sword and sorcery is about danger and exploration. It's about putting ourselves out into unknown spaces and surviving dangers and things that we could never have imagined, you know? And that's what makes it so cool. It's not like a modern connected world full of technology where we've kind of wiped out all the mysteries and we know every corner of the map and we can call each other in an instant everywhere that conan goes is a new challenge and a new mess you know mystery to be uncovered and the hyborian age is this alternate prehistory of our world it's filled with dark mysteries and dark magic conan is he's a mercenary he's a warrior he's filled with wanderlust and he travels the land in search of adventure wherever he goes there's going to be something really exciting there's going to be something utterly badass and we're going to bring that kind of excitement you know to you every single month that's the that's the one minute pitch every single issue i said to you know, i've said to rob we're going to have a marquee moment there's a two page spread or there's a big crazy visual hook that is going to stick in readers minds and we need to deliver that punch every single month. You're going to get your money's worth. You're going to flip that page. I mean, every page is beautiful, but that big moment, that marquee moment, every single time I write it and in the plot outline and I go, Rob, this is the one, like turn it up to 11 and, and deliver. And he keeps doing it every single issue that that moment hits and it's, it's stirring stuff. Uh, you know, if we can live up to the potential and the legacy that this character deserves, then there is no reason why this shouldn't be a new, you know, kind of incredible era for one of the biggest characters in literature and the original sword and sorcery hero. For those who just saw this interview, how do they get into Conan now? When do your stories from Titan begin? Right. So free comic book day is, uh, if you don't know what that is, you should totally get on board. Your local comic book shop will almost certainly be, participating. There's free comics that they're going to be getting in the door. Conan number zero comes out that day. You just have to show up to the shop and get your copy. Uh, you're going to get a really cool original 12 page story that shows the battle of Venarium and kind of the inspiration for Conan's wanderlust to go off and travel the world. Rob and Jose and I, Richard Starkings on lettering, we're pouring it all out in that zero story and showing you what you need, you know, to, to get you pumped for what is yet to come. 
Uh, on Free Comic Book Day, you'll still have time to pre-order issue one. Issue one of Conan, I believe, is coming the third week of July. So we're going to have, uh, I believe, pre-launch copies at San Diego Comic-Con. And then it comes into stores the following Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's going to be monthly. It's going to be utterly kick-ass. We've got this incredible story. You can pre-order it from your local comic book shop. You can start up a subscription box if you don't already have one, and they can put aside that issue for you every month. Uh, we're doing 22 pages of utterly ass-kicking storytelling every single month, and we've got a big, long, cool story planned with artwork that is going to blow your hair back. All right, I look forward to checking that out and to eventually be talking uh, to you again about uh, how the story is going uh, as it uh, really gets uh, gets off the ground. Uh, with that for now, I just want to say thank you for your time and uh, look forward to reading your stories. Thanks, man. And this, to honestly, to all the, the kind of um, Robert E. Howard fandom, the messages I've gotten over the years working on the character has been so supportive and so, you know, the enthusiasm that people have for this world, it, you know, I know how much of an honor it is to work on this. And every single time I've gotten the chance to do it, it feels incredibly special. I'm not kidding. This one's like the big one. This is, we, we've put it all into place. I cannot wait for people to read these stories. I cannot wait for them to see what we've got planned and to see uh, how well it all comes together. So thank you for the support. Please uh, go out, check it out. You will not be disappointed. Thank you for your time, Jim. And everyone, please head on over to your retailer to order the books or to the description for direct links. But I know you all have one more question. What is up with the live action Conan series? Let's ask the head of Heroic Signatures. Frederick, what is going on with Conan in live action? Great question again, Andre. You don't, uh, you're not shy, are you? Um, I wish I could tell you. I can't tell you right now. I hope that we will actually be able to tell uh, the world about our plans this summer. Um, and um, as you can understand, it's a space which is, it needs to be done right. We failed the last time around, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and this time we don't want to repeat that. So. You know, but it's better to be safe and sorry and not spill the beans until it's ready to be spent. Well, we all look forward to hearing more when you can share. Until then, we have Conan Exiles and a new line of Conan comic books to look forward to. So with that, I would again like to thank you and Jim Sub for your time. And everyone, check out Conan Issue Zero for free comic book day in May and Issue One in July.